Attic, and there's a wee bit of a, a backstory to how that, that title came about. Um, Christmas 1990, four filmmakers, uh, two of whom are here today, Orla Walsh and uh, Michael Doyle, along with Dan Devaney and Arto Leary, filmed a number of people who were out in parole at Christmas time, including myself and a number of others from the Heach Plugs, but also interviewed a number of former uh, women prisoners from Armagh Jail and uh, put it all together into a, a film called Ten Years On, which was for the, the 10th anniversary of the hunger strike. And um, i never seen it, uh, but I hope now to get a copy from, from Orla. But um, last year, given that the 40th anniversary was going to be coming up, I thought I'd make a bit of an effort to try to get the footage that was there. So I did a run of the houses, you know, Orla. And, well, I didn't talk to Michael, but Danny and all, everybody thought, no, I don't have them. I think maybe Northern Visions has them, or Danny thought Art had them, and Art thought Danny had them. So it went round and it didn't, didn't go anywhere. And this year, myself and Michelle made a concerted effort. So she uh, badgered Danny to get into his attic to check that he had it. And uh, eventually checked. He didn't have the tapes. Found a pair of other things that he thought he had lost, but he didn't get the tapes. Uh, Art was adamant he didn't have them. He made up an odd copy or whatever. And uh, again, I, I pursued him. Until he finally went into his attic, and there was the original tapes, all of them together, along with the transcripts that, 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 that Orla had typed up. So I drove down to Dublin, picked them up and brought them back, and Michelle had them digitised. The 16 hours of footage, um, there's various people, Bernard McAlliskin and Jerry Adams were also at a few at the time, but for this screening, we wanted to have just the women's voice, uh, and particularly the women prisoners. So we'll have Sheila Dara, who was the OC of the women prisoners in Armagh, taken over from Maria Farrell, once Maria went on the hunger strike in 1980. We had Mary Doyle, who was on the 1980 hunger strike. And Jennifer McCann, who was sentenced a few days after Bobby started his hunger strike, and she made a, a speech from the dock. And they're all with us today, and we could just give a, a round of applause for them. And they, uh, the screen is about 35 minutes, and after that we'll have a Q&A with Elish Rooney, who's a emeritus scholar with the Transitional Justice at the uh, University of Ulster. And um, I suppose that's all I want to say. Other than that, I think the, the, the title is more than a little ironic, that it's tapes from the attic. It was tapes that were not purposely hidden away, but they were away, they were out of sight. Uh, and now they've been brought to light, but it's often like a lot of the women in history have been written out of it, usually deliberately. Um, or just it's a sort of afterthought, so I'm delighted that the Belfast Film Festival can give this small platform to the women's story of the struggle in Armagh Prison. So, thank you. And then for my massive oversight of neglecting to mention Mary Ellis at the start, I was so focused on, on Mary and Sheila and, uh, and Jennifer here. Um, Mary couldn't be here because uh, of health reasons, and we wish her a full and, and speedy recovery. And what we are hoping once the festival is over that uh, we can arrange for a, for a screening. Up in Derry. So, uh, apologies, Mary. Just want to check if this mic is working okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, speaking for myself, there's kind of silence inside me after that most impressive film. I want to thank film festival people. Lawrence yourself for the work that's been done. But I'd like us to put our hands together and give a, a roaring cheer to these three women. You'll never believe it, but rumour has it that they're a bit nervous about this conversation. <laughs> I can't believe that. I can't believe that. The nervousness is all on my part. Ah, oh, well, draw breath and tell me what did you think of seeing that film? Yeah. How are you feeling? So you haven't seen it that. Well, can I say I was mortified? <laughs> <laughs> Next three of us. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, you have to keep going. <laughs> yeah. I was a very intense young woman, wasn't I? <laughs> but uh, in saying that, it's, it's I mean, for, for people especially who weren't around at that time or, 
you know, don't remember a lot of that time. I suppose it's 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 great to see that. Um, it's great to hear those voices, especially Mary Ellis. Um, Mary Ellis is, is she's she's just superb in it. And the last few words that she speaks about finding out what the difference was between nationalism and republicanism, seeing all these nationalists lined up against so many hundreds of prisoners, and a lot of them, a lot of those prisoners went through the H blocks in Armagh, um, went through the conveyor belt of British justice, and signed statements for things that they didn't do. And I know it's easy to say you weren't in jail for something you didn't do, but believe it or not, there were hundreds that went through it. And I think Mary's last few words just sum up the situation at that time, and to an extent probably still at this time, because some people's politics just haven't moved on. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, a, it was all watching yourself from so many years ago, I mean, 30 years ago that was recorded. Um, I think that, that really, that I suppose in one sense, it, it's a really good project um, because it does give the history of people who were there at the time. But for younger people, particularly younger women, and I see a lot of them in the audience here, you know, I think that, that it, it's very, it's good to see the voices of women there. And as Sheila said, you know, um, that particularly Mary Nellis, because I sometimes think that, you know, we do a lot of these, we did do a lot of these talks, um, you know, after getting out of prison and that. But a lot of the, the, the stories of the women who were in those RAC groups and who protested and we went to America, went to Europe, went everywhere. You know, mothers um, and, and sisters and, and wives and that. I think sometimes it's an untold story from, from that, but um, we, we, I couldn't get over how young we were, really. I mean, it, it's just, I mean, I've seen a photograph just uh, of the Lord he was going to be killed about the Val Dugan jumper that I had on. I haven't a clue where that came from. Somebody must have given me that or let me that. But I think that, that um, just in one sense, you know, we did concentrate, and obviously that was it about the hunger strikes and a very sad period in the jail. But there were good times in the jails too, and I think that you know even the comradeship that the women had, and Mary pointed out the fact that we were a very small number of women, but you know the age of the women that went in, I mean very very young women. Um, I was probably one of the oldest, and I was only twenty, just turned twenty, and I was probably one of the oldest that was there. I was one of sixteen, seventeen. And I think that also the comradeship that we had with the men in the box as well, you know, through smuggled letters, the comms and things like that. So, and not just in the H box and other jails, and I know John Boy's here, John Boy McComb, the prisoners that were in England and the prisoners that were in, you know, all Port Leash and all those other jails as well. So for me, I mean, there were, that was a really dark time in 1981, but there were, you know, good, and uh, we still have friendships today with some of the women, you know, that we met then, so, you know. Just some experience, I suppose. Thanks, Jennifer. Yeah. Well, it, it was a bit strange looking back 30 years ago, you know, and as you can tell, I had a hard paper around, but I hardly <laughs> need to. But um, mixed emotions about it, you know. Um, it's a, a part of our past, our history, that will never be out of your mind, you know. And especially with coming up to the 40th, that our with it being the 40th anniversary, you know, and I mean, it's the families that are always on my mind, you know, what they um, went through, you know, we as comrades and friends, you know, we we felt the terrible lot, but so what must it have been like for the families? I, I just can't even contemplate, you know, so, um, for all the, the, the mothers and wives, brothers, sisters, um, and their children, you know, they're the ones I think of, they, obviously, along with our ten comrades. But, I mean, I think it's a war cry of me. I've always said, I'm not being biased. I've always thought that women have always been the backbone of the struggle. I mean, and that, that goes back from the very start of the conflict, when the men... Um, were arrested, it was the women was left, there are families, have two or three jobs to put a loaf of bread on the table. 
they organised all the protests and and everything like that. And the majority of women always like to stay in the background, and they never want, they never done it to be applauded or uh, for appreciation. It was a necessity. And as what was already been said, that I mean, I don't think I'd ever have seen the inside of uh, a prison cell only because of there was a war going on. Just what you're saying there, Mary, I mean, I listened to the interviews or watched them too and thought these women knew what they were doing. They knew what you were doing whenever you were talking and answering questions at the interview. That as you were saying there, Tanker, you were wanting to get across what the circumstances were like, yourself too, you know, and what was going on. You're being interviewed today and I'm wondering what would you want to say? What do you want to convey today in this interview? Okay, you just watched that, and it's 30 years ago, and it's the 40th anniversary. But from your point of view and perspective today, what would you be wanting to convey in an interview that maybe other people will watch in a number of years' time? Not me, yeah. <laughs> um, I think Eilish, what I want to convey is, I think Sheila was very, very heavy up in the nail on the head when she said about it wasn't anything that we ever, and I think somebody, the, I mean, the conflict came to us, came to our streets, came to our homes, came to our doors. We didn't grow up, or just as Mary said, you know, we probably, we would never have been in prison, and it would have been the same for all the women, and I'm sure the men as well. And I think that, that, that we found ourselves in a situation, you know, where discrimination and equality and all those those things that are, you know, that, that we, we took a we took a position against that, and you know, um, uh, and as I said, you know, we became part of the struggle then for that sense of e uh, equality, the sense of justice, the sense of you know that that, that you want to be treated the same as equals. Um, and I think for today, you know, when we look at how far we came, I think for me that's the message. Just, you know, particularly the young people, um, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to go out our doors without running into an REC patrol or British Army patrol. When we were kids going to school, getting our school bags searched, homes getting raided, people being murdered, people being killed on the streets. You know, all that was all happening when we were all growing up, when we were we were young young girls growing up in, in that sort of conflict um, situation. And I think that, that when we look at how far we came, and we look now at the whole conversation where it's going now about the New Ireland, the United Ireland, and, you know, I, I, for me anyway, it gives me a great sense of, of almost, you know, hope and achievement almost, um, I, 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 don't mean, I don't mean it in that, in that words, but that basically that we, in my lifetime, will now see a New Ireland, a New United Ireland, and I'm, what, 61 now, you know, for the young people in particular, you know, and, and just to cherish that because, you know, for me, when I look back on those years, we're lucky sitting here today. Three of us are lucky sitting here today. There's a lot of our comrades who aren't here for for ones that died in hunger strike and ones like who died in, in other circumstances because of the conflict and because of the situation. So I think for, you know I feel lucky. I feel lucky anyway, and I think that, that for particularly and it's so good to see young people being part of that conversation now for New Ireland, the United Ireland, and, and the, the the sort of the discrimination and the inequalities that we faced as nationalists and republicans, as Catholics. But I also think, obviously, you know, I mean, there, there's things that still have to be challenged today, and there's change needed, there's big change needed, I mean, there's poverty, um, we need better housing, we need, you know, more employment and all those issues as well, um, and health issues and things. But I do think that we are in a far better place, and for me, that's the sense of thing that I would like to say, particularly for young people today. Thank you. Well, um, I obviously agree with everything that Jennifer has said. Um, my big thing is now the opportunities, which none of us had, but what young ones have, you know, today. And, I mean, it, it's absolutely marvellous to see working class areas now that the young ones now going to uni. Um, 
getting an education and especially to um, all the Irish schools, you know, it does my heart good. When I think of my children who went, both of them went to uni, you know, I'm, I'm so proud. And now my grandchildren are going through the Irish education, you know. And, and uh, I know that, and it really annoys me when you hear people saying, oh, there's nothing's happened, there's been no change. As Jan rightly said, there still has things to happen, but there has been massive changes. Um, we can't forget it. And as Bobby said, our revenge will be the laughter of our children. Um, I think because things have changed so much recently in the past few years, there are people who are very much afraid of that change. And there's elements of revisionism creeping in. Um, there's people, it's, it's the only way to describe them is deniers. You know, people who should have more sense who are denying what happened in the 60s and 70s and why the civil rights movement came about in the first place and why armed struggle came about. It wasn't that somebody woke up one morning and said, hey, do you know what, Mum will go out and have a pop with the Brits. You have to always look at everything in, in context and you have to look at the history of this place in context and it was a stinking wee sectarian state and there's no other way to describe it. That's what it was set up as. Um, the changes are they're tremendous. Um, I like to say I would like to think that no other young person in this country would go through what we went through. And the revisionists also have to question why so many and you're not talking for just four hundred in the H blocks and forty in Armagh. You're talking thousands of people went through the prisons. Thousands. You have to consider internment, those who were in the political status, those who were in on the protest, and then those who followed us. Thousands. Um, and looking at the minute, I mean, you, there's talk about the British government introducing an amnesty, and that amnesty is, is designed to cover up their dirty war here in these six counties. Because, mark my words, that goes right to the door of 10 Downing Street. That involves MI5, MI6, all sorts of agents, and that's what they want to cover up. And they're glossing it over nearly as if, well, sure, Republicans are going to get that too. But keep in mind, all those thousands who already went through jail, all those thousands and thousands and thousands of years that Republicans spent in jail, and look at what the British have spent in their jails. So there is this, there's still... There's still a lot of mixing going on in the background. Nothing's perfect. It's not perfect. And when we're talking about a united Ireland, we're talking about a new Ireland. We're not talking about uh, a right-wing free state that we'd be absorbed into that. We're talking about an Ireland where everybody has a part in it, where nobody would ever be treated and discriminated against in the way that we were growing up. Uh, I, I I would never stand by and watch that happening. And the pity of it is that there are still some people around us who won't get involved in those discussions. And I think at some stage they're just going to have to open their eyes and realise change is coming. It's coming and, and they can't hold it back. And the only good thing about it is that nobody's dying to change it anymore. Nobody's losing their lives anymore. And I, th I think that's a good thing. Just to pick up on a number of things that have been said already, I'm thinking particularly of women in the struggle and women in the prisons and you were saying about them being in the backbone and in the background. Yeah. Um, there have been stories told about women uh, prisoners in books, in plays, in film. And I'm thinking of what you just said there, Sheila, about how things are represented after the event. And I'm not sure, you know, aside from your own book, Sheila, which I recommend everyone reading today, you know, reading and reading it for today, for an understanding of today, really, and 
for an understanding of the past. It's a wonderful book. But I want to ask you to think about ways that women ex-prisoners have been represented or women involved in the struggle have been represented and what you've got to say about that. I mean, you were representing yourselves there as ex-prisoners and recalling a certain time and saying this is, this is how it was. So you had your voices heard. That hasn't happened in quite a long time, I think. How do you feel about how you've been represented? Well, personally, you see, I don't even I don't even think about anymore about being an ex prisoner because being an ex prisoner I think doesn't define me. Um, I'm a political activist and have been from before I went to jail and after I went to jail and right up to this day. That that defines me. My politics define me more than anything. Um, Jennifer, for instance, I mean, ex-junior minister in, in the Assembly, Mary's an ex-Belfast City Councillor, but they too, I see as being defined as Republican women, not as Republican women ex-prisoners. Um, I find that in discussions and, and stuff like that, because, probably because there's such a small number of them in three arma at the time, that the same names keep coming up again. And a lot of women got out of jail and went on with their lives and went on with their politics and went on with everything else. And went back to being those women who were on the streets during the protests or those women, because it's it's not just the ex-prisoners that you have to think about. You think about the likes of the Mary Nellis and the people around you. Um, so, it's not that you have to fight to be recognised as an ex-prisoner um, when things like this come up um, and when hunger strike anniversary stuff come up. I do remind people, you know, about the gender balance. Um, but as I say, it's not being an ex-prisoner is not something that I go and boast about. You know, I don't introduce myself to people as... How you doing? I'm Sheila Dara. I'm an ex-prisoner. Um, I'm Sheila Dara, a Republican. And that's what defines me more than anything else. I, I don't know about Mary or Jennifer, but that's my feeling on it. Well, no, I would, I would agree. Um, I think that, that really, I mean, so long ago, we were all in prison as well. Um, I think that, that there is obviously, I mean, there are still concerns that, and, and issues that face sex prisoners, you know, uh, in society today. You can't really say that, you know, there's still a, an inequality there for the like of, with adopting children or insurance, things for house insurance, car insurance. There's different issues there. But I think that, that really, um, I think it's good that women who actually uh, lived the struggle, um, not just us three and Mary, but, you know, women who... And all aspects of the struggle, I mean, going to prison was just one aspect of it. I think that the, the women who came through that struggle for, um, and who, who, who maybe are less known, I can see now there's more and more women speaking at events like this. Um, I, th I mean, I congratulate Sheila for her book. I would like to see more women, um, maybe Mary will take this on, on writing more. You know, I think that, that it, it's a good thing. I think that, that you even look now, and I know Sheila referred to it, even the political representatives, particularly in Sinn Féin, there's quite, there, I think there's actually more women now than there are male up in the assembly and things like that, you know, and they're in prominent positions. We have two strong women leaders. So I think, I think that, that women have, you know, made that, um, you know, they, they, they are becoming um, more sort of open and speaking about their role in the struggle, I think that the women um, have actually, you know, actually shown younger women in particular. And I think for me, I mean, if you part of back to the young women, I think that's very, very important that we're seen as role models, good role models for for younger women because I think that that you know, I and, and I would always say, young women, you know, don't let anyone do a sort of shine on your, your right or dull your right down. If you have something that you want to do in life, you no, know, go for it and do it. Because I think that, that 
you know, a lot of a lot of women, particularly when we were growing up, you know, it was it was you you, you had uh, so sort of more sexism then and more gender inequality in that. I think that women now are becoming more sort of um, just just more you know st stronger in themselves as well. And I, and I also think that that you know it always defied me as as a Republican woman it wasn't being an ex prisoner because as Sheila said. We were part of the, the struggle before we went to prison. We were part of the struggle in prison. And then we became part of the struggle when we came back out of prison again as well. And that, that goes for most of the women, you know, that, 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 were, that were there. But um, I just think that, that really, in terms of um, just go for it, follow your dreams. Um, and that's what I would say to most young women and I. Thanks. Well, Obviously, I agree with both what Sheila and Jennifer said. I mean, um, I am a, a Republican woman. Uh, I was a Republican wee girl at one time, and then I matured. <laughs> but um, I, I don't live in the past. I, be, I, I might be an ex-prisoner, but I have to say I'm very proud of my past. But um, I, I would just say that the younger people and even older people that are maybe only fighting their feet too, you know, the, the, for their voice to be heard and, and go for it, as Jennifer said, the words are oyster. You know, you can only but try. And, you know, don't let nobody put barriers up for you. I don't want to take you to the past, but there is a, an experience that you've had that I think is worth some reflection. And that is how women in armed struggle were treated. And it's of interest and use to people who are looking at armed struggles elsewhere that are current in the world. Um, women in armed struggle and who ended up in the prison were viewed by wider society, I'm putting this to you, as um, in some way doubly guilty because they had gone against the gender expectations that were prevalent at the time. Women were not supposed to take up arms or to engage in struggle in that way. So that, uh, you know, it was accepted that men would. So I want to, if I can ask you, I can get some reflection on, you know, has that changed? Or are we in a circumstance where we really don't know? But what was the experience like where you were treated as, like, betraying your gender? Well, I don't know about these two, but I was charged with membership. <laughs> so um, it's not that I'm going to discuss my involvement in our struggle. It's that within, you see, there are people who pass a judgment too. There were people who passed a judgment years ago about the Republican movement, and specifically uh, from a lot of women from back in the, the 70s and 80s from the women's liberation movement and, and I think that originally grew up in, in England and then started in Dublin and then moved to Belfast and they had this attitude that women who were involved in armed struggle or women who were in the IRA or women who were in jail were, to, were part of a, what they described it as was a male dominated organisation and were allowing themselves to be part of a male dominated organisation and the point the only point I can put to that is Republicans didn't go out and tell you know you didn't walk up to somebody and say here I'm, I've joined the RA you know it was a secret organisation so how did all these women's movements know how many men and women were in it I couldn't have told you how many men and women were in it um, there was, I recall when, when, you know, people were calling on these women's organisations to support the women in Armagh because it was a women's issue and they were throwing the same thing back at us. It was, no, they're part of a male, a very male dominated organisation and therefore we can't support them. <coughs> and that to me is a contradiction. It was all right to be a member of uh, the women's liberation movement, but it wasn't all right to be a woman in a liberation movement. 
And if you look at other liberation movements throughout the world, like the Sandinistas and, you know, um, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Palestine, South Africa, women are always part of that struggle. Always, in every struggle. Um, and even within the, the further outreaches of a, a guerrilla struggle, that struggle won't survive without the men and women who are in the streets or in their houses or marching for change. So it's not something that you can specifically talk about, but I can say that in, in the context of republicanism, I was never treated any different. I was never any less than anybody else. And I think on the streets during that time, that's the way it was in Republican areas. Nobody, nobody um, judged you on your gender. Yeah, um, uh, agree with what she was saying there. Um, uh, and just to, to what you were saying there about we treat it differently by the I'm assuming you're mean the courts and things like that. I think that 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 in terms of if you look at the the statistics, and it's still the same today. If you look at the statistics of the people of women who are sent to prison, the biggest majority of women who now go to prison just even for, you know, um, uh, social offences, they're, they're, they have, you know, they, they, they have mental health issues, they spend longer time, I, I remember doing, there was like a, a study done, and the amount of women who were in prison for long payment of fines was something like travel the amount of men who were in for the same type of offence. So, I think there is an inherent bias there um, in terms of, you know, um, not so much, um, I suppose, in a historical sense, but it's also, you know, that, that you're a place, you, you've, you've come out of where you're supposed to be, you, were, you know, and I think that, that that was reflected in some of the sentences that some of the women got, because I can remember um, in McGabry, there was, a, there was also a woman who committed McGabry, um, Anne Kavna, and Anne got 10 years for... Um, she had, they said it was a, 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 a dump in her house, but it was not that old. You know, it was, it was totally empty. And that was, a, a, again, I think, because Anne was a mother, a single mother as well. I think, you know, it was almost like, you know, you, you know, and it was, it, I mean, she did, she did, because remember the sentences changed and you went back to three quarters of the sentence, so she, she did, by seven and a half years on, dead and I got the rest of her. But, I'm just saying that, 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 that sometimes, you know, they did look at you like that, um, even in, when you were arrested, you know, like, what are you doing, you know, young girl, like, you should be going to the schools, thinking of going to the schools, going out with boys and all this, you know, what are you, what are you doing, and all, from the attitude from the, the cops and that. So I do think that that, that, that was probably um, that bias. I mean, obviously that bias is right through society, and I think that it's still there. And, and particularly the, those institutions. But I also think that, that what Sheila says is right. I mean, I can remember, and we did have a good comradeship with some of the women, remember the women against imperialism and all those women who used to protest out in international women's say outside the jails. But we had a very strong comradeship with our male comrades as well. You know, okay, you might not have always agreed with them and, you know, you, 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 you sort of like challenged them when they were being sexist or when they were being, you know, um, whatever, but we also, you know, I mean, as a Republican woman, we were discriminated because we were Republicans, not just because we were women, you know what I mean? So I think that that, that whole, that whole battle, and I didn't, I've never seen the two things as separate. I've never seen the, 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 the fight for women's equality and the fight for, for Irish freedom as being separate um, struggles. To me, it's about fighting for the rights of all people, whether it's male or female. So in the end of the day, you know, uh, that, that's the way. Uh, you, you can't sort of uh, say it's okay for to be free as a woman, but not okay to be free for, uh, as, as an Irish woman. So I think that that, that, that whole, you know, to me, this one struggle was the same. Um, so I think that, that, that obviously there was the inherent bias with some of the courts and things like that, but I think as a, as a struggle, you know, we were very much, um, you know, uh, I feel like in, in the movement, treated as equals. Thank you, Mary.
Well, I mean, I've always found myself being treated as equal because I wouldn't have let them treat me any other way. Um, but, I mean, everything, I don't want to go over everything that Sheila and, and Jennifer said, but I agree that there is, you know, under this day, there still is. And uh, that's something that we're just going to have to keep fighting about. But personally, I mean, within the movement and everything, we're all the same. Thank you. I'm going to turn to the audience in just a, a minute to ask you about any questions that you might have. To encourage you to get into the conversation and raise any issue that has occurred to you throughout the film and in the discussion here. But the question I want to ask um, the three of you and I is, I mean, you've mentioned the constitutional conversations and where things are at at the moment. Um, just want to ask you, so there's, there's uh, Brexit, the protocol, the environment crisis that's very much in the news at the moment, as well as constitutional conversations calling on the Irish government to start making preparations for a referendum. So there may be other issues that are prominent in your own minds. I want to ask you to tell us what concerns you most about the present moment and what gives you most hope. Um, what concerns me most is that Unfortunately, we're still tied to uh, a British government, a Tory government, to an island and to a parliament that, quite frankly, doesn't give a damn about us, doesn't give a damn about the six counties, and that includes unionism. Um, in terms of Brexit, the vote here in these six counties was to remain within Europe, but again, we were ignored. The vote in the 1920s was to say as a united country, we were ignored. Um, unfortunately, the sad part of it is that there are anti-protocol voices, anti-protocol pro-Brexit voices being heard, and it's, it's nearly like because they're shouting the loudest. Uh, we still have a biased media here who are giving them the outlet to do their shouting the loudest. But if you dig down deep into it, you'll find a lot of business people will be telling you that uh, the protocol is the best thing for these six counties. But we're handcuffed to lunatics, and until we do something about it, until we do something about it here, um, that's going to continue because you can shout all you want about uh, the assembly not. You know, not taking this rule or not taking that rule or not deciding on this, and you have to understand that um, the progressive or people within the assembly can't move because we're also handcuffed to people who are totally opposed to us politically, and we basically cut their noses off despite their faces, and that's what they're doing. And until that filters down, right down to working class people, and I think there's a lot of working class people probably within unionist areas who are, are just in despair because their political leaders aren't leading. Um, and I, I find it very frustrating. I just find it very frustrating. Um, I, I would hope that those conversations would open up more. I just wish that uh, the 26th government, the 26th county government would, would start to stand up to the government on that other island because at the minute they're still acting as if, you know, they're the wee boys. Um, that's a difficulty, but hopefully in the next next election, both north and south, that'll begin to change. That's what I'd hope for anyway. I'm just going to ask Jennifer and Mary if you'll hold on because I want to give the audience a chance to come in. We've just got you know, five, ten minutes to go. So. Over to you, friends. Would anyone like to raise their hand with a question or a contribution? Person at the back here, back here. That's all, okay. Uh, but uh, I'm glad with her old ladies uh, speaking there, and maybe the ladies is the wrong thing, I'm glad to hear the three volunteers. And I'm really proud of them. And uh, Mary said to her that women in the back room in the struggle, and I believe that, I believe that wholeheartedly. Uh, there was bad times in the struggle where there was uh, super grass, isn't it? I don't many 
uh, women who became super rats. They are the strongest and they are the backbone. Uh, I'd like to say, at the start of sitting there, is if butter wouldn't melt in their mouths, but obviously they were active volunteers, so they're not... Alleged, alleged. <laughs> anyway, they're not pacifists, but uh, in the late up to the, in the hunger strike period, there were struggles within our jail uh, before that, and I, I've heard a little bit about it, and I don't know if any of the volunteers uh, were there, when they, when they took the governor and some prison officers hostage, if they could speak about that. I think it was around the time of the Bundle on Cash. cash. Uh, I think you're in for another event. I think that's a call for another event. <laughs> well, you've got information about that because that, that shows that they are, they're melting people when they need to be. Thank you. Anyone else? Our pool perms, I thought were absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and can I just say, I'm the only one with natural hair. That's rather cruel, Sheila. You don't make it say that's a very poor girl. Comradely and all. No hope. We, Sheila's had the last word here. Mary Nellis would have loved Japing with us, and they have contributed to the debate. We're really sorry she's not. But we are actually going to get Mary Ellis the last word. The lights are going to go down, Mary Ellis is going to speak, and the event will be over. I'm going to write a book on it someday. I want to write a book on the humorous side of it. You know, what I mean? <laughs> talking to you about it as the tragic side of it. But there was there was an absolutely amazing humorous side to that whole thing. You know, the thing when when you're when you start tripping around the country and you're bare feet in a blanket, it produces all sorts of funny things. You know, you're you're deadly and intense. You know, and one of the things that has always happened to us is the Republicans were always organising it for you know in the south of Ireland. So you had all these Sinn Féin men, and they always had cattle lorries. You know, inevitably at a cattle lorry. And if you ever try to negotiate a cattle lorry in your bare feet, they're holding you, your modesty with a blanket, you know, and a placard at the same time. And anyhow, we were in Galway, I think it was, and uh, we, we, we had great problems getting up in this cattle lorry and these big hefty men. At the end, they used to lift us and sort of throw us up unceremoniously, you know. Anyhow, we were, we were wondering how we'd get down, you know. And anyhow, I, I, I said, well, look, we'll sit down. There were three of us sit down there and jump. And these big men were standing looking at him saying, Jung, Mrs. Will Hatchie. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, this wee woman, who, Peggy McCull, who had two sons in prison too as well, she, she was a really funny woman. And, I mean, she wasn't a bit politicised, but she was in everything that she went and everything that was going. <laughs> whatever way she, this, this other woman, Aileen her name's a big hefty woman, whatever way Aileen went to get down, didn't she? St she sat on the edge of Peggy's blanket, and when she jumped, Peggy was left. <laughs> <laughs> and the crowd went. <laughs> the first <laughs> Republican protest. <laughs> I'll never forget that. <laughs> I think that they never got over it in Galway. I think it must be something shock yet. <laughs> and oh, it was awful. And it, well, you should have seen the scramble for the blanket and everybody covering Peggy up. And, and I said to her afterwards, how did you feel? And she says, well, I went blind. I saw nobody. <laughs> I said, but they saw you. 